So hi. Um, All right. My name is Amon Elise. I'm here with Maceo. Wait. <laughs> wait, wait. Uh, yes, you are. That is true. So before we start, let me just give a little introduction mm -hmm. um, about what's going on and what's going to happen. My name is Maceo. Um, the executive director of Citizens of Culture, and this is No Pressure, No Shame. We are here to talk about sex, relationships, dating, um, bodies, pleasure, um, and I'm very happy to have a guest with me, an artist and advocate, um, Aman Elise. Thanks for joining us. No, thanks for having me. Um, I didn't say much about you, but um, what the purpose of No Pressure, No Shame is to reimagine dating etiquette, the way that we come together in romantic partnership from, uh, you know, from dating all the way to marriage and divorce. It's, it's, it's a big challenge that humanity is, is dealing with right now. How do you fit into this and what is your little uh, sort of bio? Um. Okay, well, like you said, my name is Mona Lise. I'm currently um, cat sitting the naughtiest of cats. <laughs> but besides that, I'm, gosh, where to begin? Uh, sometime in college, I got really uh, enthusiastic about consent and about um, what sex looks like. And that's mainly because I was having terrible terrible after terrible experience and uh, romance novels are my bread and butter and I was like how can we bridge this gap how can um, I raise my voice how can I strengthen the voices of others um, and what ended up happening is that I ended up talking to other women and being like is this a shared experience how can we be better how can um, we cause more, how can we cause more love in our lives in the right way, um, in ways that we enjoy and invite. And then I ran off to the Peace Corps, and that was two years of abstinence. <laughs> and I came back ready to tackle the world <laughs> and um, decided to do that through poetry, through conversation, um, and through expression. Uh, in college, I was teaching yoga, and so I got into breath work, which, you know, if anyone gets too far into breath work, you kind of run into Tantra, and that's like the, it's the center, in my opinion, it's where yoga and sex meet, um, and I, I ran with it from there, so I tend to focus on yoga, Tantra works, and uh, poetry, which is my, like, personal favorite form of expression um, and they all kind of blend together to discuss consent, to discuss how we could be having better sex and to discuss um, ways in which we could ask for it. And so that's, that's, that's a little bit of me. Um, along the way, I gained a very passionate um, sense of of what of, of all things sensual really i like to take normal everyday events and get the most pleasure out of them possible and it doesn't always have to be sexual a lot of people um, misunderstand arousal as sex and arousal is just a state of excitement that the body previously wasn't in and you can gain that from eating you can gain that from light touch you can gain that from a visual stimuli so it it all comes together for me. I'm not sure if that was concise, but I hope I painted a, a, an accurate picture. No, it, it, it doesn't have to be concise. People have a little time. Um, what, it sounds like you're going through a period of transition in the way that you see sex and pleasure and the way that you approach it. Um, if you don't mind, what was it like before? in relationship to now? My sex life? Or just the way you approach uh, pleasure and sensuality? So, when I was younger, <laughs> um, if you could believe it, <laughs> when I was younger, uh, 
I wasn't allowed to talk to boys. Um, boys were like a forbidden situation in my house. And so there were always like, in my opinion, once you deny a child something that becomes their like next big bad. Um, and so as fast as my mother was coming up with ways to keep me from them, I was coming up with quicker ways to talk to them. Um, and that ended up, but also at the same time being raised in a don't have sex until you're married situation. And I was like, well, I'm not going to have sex until college. <laughs> and so I had to get creative with what intimacy looked like for me and um, a, the boyfriend at the time. So it started there where boy, like the, the men I were dating at the time would be like, this is what sex is. Um, in penetration, um, oral sex, moaning, spit, um, grunting, forcefulness. And I didn't really like that much. I like to be, I like to, I like to be held. I like softness. I like to receive. Um, and the, I guess the men I was entertaining, or the, the boys at that time entertain, that I was entertaining at the time didn't really know what that looked like because it wasn't accurately portrayed in porn. And that brought about the question to me, like, why are we learning this from porn? I feel like there's a huge gap in what sex education could be because we only talk about the biological standpoint of it. And we don't talk about like what, how pleasurable it can be and how to say yes and when to say yes. And so we allow outside sources to dominate our definitions. And, um, I was, like I said, I was devouring romance novel after romance novel, reading Zane and um, Eric Jerome Dickey and Octavia Butler and <laughs> thinking like, man, sex could be so interesting. And they're on Pornhub and XNXX.com or whatever. And then those are two dramatically different definitions of sex. Um, and so where do you meet? Uh, in college, I was kind of more adamant that I wanted sex to be interesting for me and I wanted to enjoy it primarily. Um, and so I kind of entered this stage where I would date virgins. <laughs> I would date the virginiest of virgin men and teach them something different. Um, and at first it was just me being selfish and being like, I kind of want a blank slate to work with. And afterward it became like they would come back and be like sex with you is different um i like the and like i like the intention and energy you put behind it let's like how do i how do i talk to my girlfriend about this and um if i was close enough with their girlfriends <laughs> we would talk about it but if not i'd be like listen man you gotta lead <laughs> you, you gotta um you know you gotta express yourself uh, and then now, now it's a whole different ball game. Now it's, I'll sit back and the first time I experience someone sexually, I will let them dictate how it goes. Not because I don't want to or not because of anything besides the fact that I want to learn where they are. And then maybe the second or third time, I'll change something up. Um, because I've learned that if I just start off with like, hey, do you want to just stare into each other's eyes and breathe a little bit uh, to focus on heightening the arousal beforehand? Or if I'm like, if they accidentally discover my collection, my toy collection, <laughs> interesting conversations pop up. So I kind of like to let them be in their safe and comfort zone first before I introduce anything too drastic, um, which to me isn't drastic, but it can be for others. And so I'm a lot more, I'm, like, I'm a lot more, let's go with the flow. And eventually, if you like it my way, um, we can try something new. And if they don't like it my way, it's not like it's my way or the highway, but I, I tend to move on just because I'm not really interested in, in certain types of sex. So how do you make sense of where you are in the world terms of, um, you know, you were saying your way versus sex is different. 
how have you made sense of where you are in the world in relationship to what you think other people might be doing or what is contemporary or, or mainstream? Like feedback from your partners, you know, like what you see and read, you're like, oh, that's not how I do it. That's not how I want to do it. It started out with feedback from my partners. Mm -hmm. And then it started out with me like directly asking people. <laughs> you ask them. Yeah, like I'd, I'll be in a, a talking group circle. I'll be talking to friends and I'll be like, hey, so when's the last time you had like really great sex? Or I'll just ask them the way some people ask, um, how's your mom? I'll ask, um, have you been, like, how have you been receiving lately? Like, have you been having troubles receiving pleasure lately? What's that look like? Um, are you able to just sit and receive? Um, a lot of people are in this, this, this whole, oh, I'm a great giver. Like, I, when you talk to someone about sex, a lot of the times you'll hear, like, um, oh, I like to give. And yeah, that's, that's great. But you're only, in my opinion, you can only be a great giver if you truly know how to receive. And a lot of us feel uncomfortable just receiving. Um, and that creates the whole invention of 69. Like, what the fuck is that? Um, I don't believe in 69s. <laughs> I Wait, believe. Tell me, tell me about that. Tell me why you don't so, believe in 69s and what you even mean by that. Just, just the sex position 69. I believe in a whole bunch of other sex positions, but I feel like 69 is cheating yourself out of peak pleasure. Why is that? You <laughs> don't smile at me like that. It's, you know, I'm curious. <laughs> um, it's because, like, I'd rather be a 68 and I owe you one. Like, let's, okay. let's. You're saying don't try to confuse giving and receiving at the at exact the same time. time. No, you can't do it at the same time because you're never truly focused in the space you need to be comfortable in receiving. I can't be, yeah, I'm going to give you all I got down here while also trying to receive everything you're trying to give me down there. Like it doesn't, the, the you're wire. Saying that, you're saying the math doesn't add up to both people being, having maximum pleasure or giving maximum pleasure. So just, exactly. So you're not into multitasking. It's not that I'm not into it. I do it every day in other types of life, just not during sex. I would much rather sit back and fully enjoy all you have to offer right. and then fully give you all I have to offer. Right. And, if it, and there is a competitive edge to 69, don't get me wrong, but I feel far more competitive after you've given me all you've had to offer and then I like blow your mind. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a different... It's an exchange of energy. It's a recharge, for example. Okay. Um, after I've received for quite some time, I'm much more willing to give you all that I have in the most creative way possible. Because mm -hmm. it's like, oh, um, I'm remembering all the good you gave me and I wanna return the favor. And I'm like, you know what? I know I'm doing like a little hand move here and I'm twisting here, but let me do it at the same time while I swirl my tongue around the tip. Like, there's a lot you can do there. And that's, that's if you're in like a, you know, I'm describing a penis here, but if you're with a woman, you know what? I will say having been with women, it, I don't bring up 69 as much. Like I never have to like navigate that. In my experience, women have always been much more willing to take it one at a time. They're a lot more willing to do one at a time to take turns during their play and to be more open to toys and role play and power dynamics mainly because what they're doing as a whole isn't considered the heteronormative standard for porn right. um, even when they're like oh lesbian porn it's like lesbian porn through a masculine gaze yeah and so yeah. two women are just in a room by themselves there's all sorts of different types of magic that can happen as opposed to usually when it's like two women in a camera and a director telling them, you know, use more tongue here. And right. Yeah. Like it's, yeah, it's, I think yeah. the thing that we get um, sometimes mix signals between what pleasure is supposed to look like and what it feels like to us. So there's probably certain things that we're 
conditioned to expect even though they don't necessarily feel good and just because we expect them then then we're satisfied by the experience living up to our expectation in some You've been conditioned to receive that right yeah exactly. and so it's like maybe it's not my favorite thing but it's familiar um have you did you have to go through a period where you had to you know in your journey as you're learning do you find that different things arouse you different things feel good um at different times um or are you pretty you know you, you think you're pretty stable like my thing is you know with partners is sometimes people want to have a sense that they uh they know your body they know you they know what can 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 please you and um within that you know knowledge sometimes routines are built up which can be good or bad you know routines can create um, um, ritual, but they can also create boredom. So how do you make sense of that space between routine and novelty? And how do you, how do you think about it even? I think of it like a backup plan. Like your routine should be your backup plan and not the, not the standard. So for example, I have a trusty bullet clit stimulator little toy thing mm -hmm. it travels with me everywhere <laughs> um it's my go-to i can get the i can enjoy myself wherever however i am um i consider a lover to be a gift to be an enjoyment um and not my backup plan and not my fallback and whenever I end up in a, in a routine with a lover, that's when I'm like, all right, it's time to try something new. Um, and that's normally when I'll break out a new toy or I'll try a new different type of foreplay or a different location even. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be giant romantic gestures. It could just be like, a, hey, instead of trying this type of music, let's try a different type of music. Or it could be, having um, intercourse in an area that's like the temperature is skyrocketing. Um, one of the best, <laughs> one of my best sexual experiences was during the California heat wave. We had all the windows closed by accident and the, it was like a furnace in the house. But for whatever reason, it just clicked for me. Um, I haven't been able to recreate it, but the spontaneity was fantastic. And it just came from something like a minor change. So do you um, find that you're able to um communicate this with your partners like is everybody do you have filters in advance to 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 know if you think uh somebody's going to be a good partner versus you know you're just attracted to them but you there probably not isn't sexual compatibility God. i mean or do you just like give it a shot and see how it goes you're so attracted let's go this is it. something that changed with age <laughs> um recently I'm attracted to the mind first. And if I'm attracted to the mind, I can find something to find attractive about your body. There's never a body that's like 100% unattractive, um, in my opinion. There's, back before now, <laughs> before, and this is like a recent change. This is like within the past year or so. Um, previously, I would need, my, my little test stimuli was, um how do you feel about something crazy like something that was out of my comfort zone which would be like um how do you feel about watching me masturbate and depending on how they answer that question would determine like if they're open enough to be open for me during sex so in my like if you're not having fun during sex i don't know what you're doing if you're not able to laugh I, I don't know what you're doing. Um, it should be, it should always have a sense of playful undertones because when we're at play, we're at our most relaxed, we're at our most free. We're willing to try something new. We're willing to have a judgment free zone and give you space to be creative and imagine things. So if um, I had a lover who preferred to have sex on the bed all the time and it got to the point where I was just not, feeling it and they would try 
to excite me and I just couldn't even be excited in the bed anymore. Um, and they were like, what's wrong? And I was just honest with them. I was like, listen, this is no longer exciting for me. I need a change of location. And they're like, what do you mean? Like a staycation? Like you want to fly somewhere? I'm like, no, let's try the couch. And they're like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, let's try the couch. <laughs> um, and the awkwardness of figuring out how both of our bodies could fit on a small space was hilarious and it let them ease up and it let me feel like it was something new um and that rekindled our spark and then we were fine in the bed after that it's just so do you do you find that you're you're actively when we talk about agency do you find that you're actively able to think about the kinds of people you want to be attracted to and then work towards that or do you believe that it's innate and it's intuitive and who you're attracted to can't be changed. Mm. I guess it can't be both. If they're, I feel like they're both inherently true, but at the same time, it's like if well, you can find it, that, say that they can't be true. No, yeah, I'm, I'm just like postulating out loud. <laughs> um, I feel like it's more true that you could you could treat yourself to love anybody. Um, I think that's proven when you have like arranged marriages that work out um that love might be there but sexual attraction might not be there um so I feel like innately you can have sex with anyone will you enjoy it as much that might be more of like a a choice thing like there's preference in, in who you want to be with but that doesn't mean that someone can't give you pleasure at all um, it, you got to be more open-minded on who you're choosing because <laughs> I forget the, the, the theory behind this, but there's a, gosh, someone brought it up that things that disgust you is still a state of arousal. Yeah, that, well, that's Freud, right? So Freud will say that disgust and arousal can be like intimately connected. Um, I guess more what I was getting at is this idea that um, maybe we grow up being attracted to a certain body type mm -hmm. um, because of what we've been conditioned to think as beautiful. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's not the body type that we have. So we have to learn to be attracted to ourselves and to feel good in our own skin and feel sexy so that we can then be comfortable with other people. or or um, there is a certain type of partner that you're with that you love, but like you said, you know, you have to develop what it feels like to feel their body and, 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 and be comfortable enjoying that. But there's a difference between that and like having to do the work for it and then not having to do the work for it, you know? You definitely have to do the work for it. So without being able to love your own body, I don't feel like you're ever going to be able to grow to love everything about somebody else. So, um, I, I, I just, I'm reading, um, a, I'm reading, still reading Pleasure Activism. Mm -hmm. And she has a practice by Adrienne Marie Brown. She has a practice where um, she started looking in the mirror and loving small parts of herself, whether it be like her pinky or whether it be a love handle or whether it be, you know, the side of the neck, she would compliment one piece about herself every day. And she couldn't repeat a piece from previous practice. And so over time she had to find something she loved about every piece of her body. Um, and that's just like a, a very tangible way to, to practice this. But the idea that I'm trying to go with is if you, choose to love everything about yourself and you're actively reaching for that it's much easier for you to find someone who may not be you know hitting all of your your bells and whistles they may hit like three of your bells and whistles but those are like three important bells and whistles mm -hmm. you can love you could find something to love about the rest of their parts if that makes sense right um, yeah there's, this, there's a theory about um, making our lists that we that we have for our partners and you know I guess the the 
person who talks about it says, make a list of three needs and three deal breakers and then let everything else go. Um, but I don't, you know, that, that's just something I've heard. So um, let's talk more about this, um, this transition. Um, did you have to like do any kind of soul searching to make this connection between spirituality and pleasure? Or was that something that you sort of came up on and realized, oh, this could be a whole thing? Um, I was exposed to. <laughs> so uh, before college, I was kind of like reading into Tantra, reading into sexual practices, because in my mind, I was like, I'm the one who's doing this wrong. I need to master all things sex so I could figure out how to to be the best there is out there. Um, <laughs> I'm laughing at it now, but I feel like it was a serious thing for me. Um, I wanted... I. I'm a Virgo. I got to study everything to feel like I have it right. And I was like, sex is something that could be studied. It's out there. There are books and research topics on it. And so I was just reading away. Um, gosh, I'm so sorry. Where was I going with this? <laughs> um, How are you? A point. Yeah. Uh, there's a point where I was like reading and I, all the Tantra books say the same thing. Like you can you don't want to go at this from a point of, I want to conquer, I want to be like this irresistible sex goddess. There's nothing wrong with that, but you're going to get a more deeper, fulfilling, satisfied sex out of it if you just um, focus more so on the love and the spiritual side. And I was, at first I was, I was a little skeptical. And then I was like, you know what, the best way to do this is to just take a class. Like the way you dive into yoga, you just take a class. Um, and so I saved up all my pennies. And when I came out here to LA, I booked a course with um, Charu. Um, I think she's in body tantra, ta in body tantra. Um, and she, she's, <laughs> she's a white lady, um, which was important for me at the time because I was very skeptical about knowledge that would come from the soul coming from anything less than the source, which is crazy because knowledge can come from anywhere. But um, when I was there, with her you're saying you wasn't black yeah i wanted i wanted all of my knowledge to be untouched by anyone who wasn't who didn't look like me which is crazy but at Wait, the time I was, like, I was elected and i was feeling you, it like you wanted the tantric teacher to be black or you wanted the tantric teacher to not be black i wanted the tantra teacher not to be white I was tired of my educational sources coming from one race, if that made sense. And so you're saying that when you first came to LA, the, the, you took a class from someone who was white. Mm -hmm. um, there wasn't a lot of, or I wasn't exposed to a lot of the time, uh, Tantra teachers of color. And there are a lot of Tantra teachers of color. They just happen to mostly be based in Atlanta. Um, and Tantra, there's so, there's so much of a variety that maybe the type of Tantra I'm teaching is not the type that really speaks to you. And she was teaching a type that spoke to me and hers was coming from a place of love and dance and ritual. And um, I took a weekend seminar of hers, our weekend class for um, couples and singles. And I was a single and it was just us doing a whole bunch of, of uh, breathing practices and meditation practices and then having homework to go home and masturbate. And it, it was life changing in a way. And I was like, holy shit, there's so much more to this than just being a sex goddess. Like I can expand my orgasm through breath and I can uh, create arousal energy and store it within my hips when I walk and attract people um, who also have a same positive energy who are willing to come through and bond with them on a root chakra level. And I know I'm saying a lot of things that might be going over people's heads, but that, that was so enlightening to me and so shocking that sex could be better without so much of the physical concepts. And if you, you know, take the time to, you know, align yourself with another human being, the possibilities sexually are endless. Right, right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure we have some time. If anybody wants to ask a question, you can type in a question. You can, um, I think maybe that's the only way, but, um, <laughs> You can type in a question into the chat if 
if you want to type it in privately, make sure you click it to the host. And if you want to type it to the group, you can just type it to all panelists. Um, and then I'll read the question and we'll keep it going that way. Um, so go ahead and type your questions if they, if they pop up while we're talking and I'll read them. If not, we'll just keep it going for a few more minutes. Um, Cause I, I definitely have stuff to talk about. Um, so, all right. What you described to me sounds kind of like Mr. Miyagi and um, in uh, Karate Kid where the kid wants to come in. He's like, I want to learn how to punch people. And you're like, I want to come and be a sex goddess. Right. And Mr. Miyagi said to Karate Kid, he's like, Hey, look, slow down, wax on, wax off, you know, paint my Buick or wash my car. And then, you know, at first the guy's like, how does this teach me karate? You know, you're like, this is not what I came here for. But you realize that there was some more fundamental stuff that you needed to get a grip on before you could open up your capacity to feel pleasure. Um, would you say that this was actually like, were there any part of it that were actually really challenging that you had to confront? Or was it just easy breezy once you got into it? I'm sorry, I was reading the question. You said it was- I'll read the question. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> but what was the last part of your question? Um, but it's okay, you can read the question since that's where your head is at. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, Antoinette says, on Tantra, it is not solely let alone firstly about sex. Please speak to that. Um, so yeah, no, it definitely is not solely and not even firstly about sex. I was approaching it wrong when I first learned about it. Um, I don't know when you came in in the, in the conversation, but definitely um, I was approaching it wrong and I had a teacher steer me in a different direction. And that's what really made Tantra peak interest into me. Um, and I got like several books. I just keep buying more books and I haven't, <laughs> I haven't, uh, read all of them like right now I'm currently reading urban tantra it's like my a chapter a night before bed situation and I'm obsessed with everything she's she's going with it but it's still a little bit too physical for me and so the next one I'm reading um the next on my my list is uh it's like tantra for beginners specifically for women and it's much more uh, spiritual based and I'm really excited I'm super excited about it um I'm hoping to eventually start sharing because a lot of people, a lot of Tantra and yoga is in books and it isn't like something you could, you could just Google. You're going to get a whole crap field of information. Um, and so I want to bridge the gaps between what's in the, the text and, you know, how we're interacting every day and to tell people, you know, verbally through video to bring, to basically bring Tantra to social media and to make it digestible for everyone. Um, because a lot of the books are dense and a thick read, and but also enlightening and still need to be shared. So that's All right. All right. Yeah, that, I mean, that's no problem. I don't mind answering questions from people. Keep, keep them coming, you know? That's what we're here for. I just ask questions in case that um, people hadn't formed them yet or they need a little bit of time to think. Um, but we want to keep Amon working because we got her for such a short period of time. Um, so thanks for answering that. All I, all I was asking actually was, did you ever find yourself in facing resistance as you were in your sort of journey and expansion or was it all kind of smooth and pretty easy? Did you find areas in your life or on your body or your preconceptions that you, you felt really challenged by that you had to confront and work through? Oh gosh. Um shyness <laughs> believe it or not I know it doesn't seem like I'm a shy person but um, in an effort to talk about this you start realizing that like my brother is watching like my mom hears my stories my grandmother chimes in every now and then and I'm like at what point am I oversharing at what point is this this fight for liberation sexually for me and sharing that so that other people can can also be liberated um it it creates some awkwardness with my mom or with my family members or with my friends um 
And eventually I just had to get over that. And as I got over it, they stopped caring. So eventually my grandmother was like, this, this is my granddaughter. This is who she's going to be. So, <laughs> um, and she won't, she won't participate, but if I ask her a question, she'll answer it. <laughs> and I'm, I'm always impressed by how our relationship has blossomed to me and my grandmother's um, and me and my mom's even over these types of things and how practice makes perfect. And over time, I'm able to, to talk to my mom about squirting, to talk to my grandmother about orgasms back in the 30s. Like, what was that like, grandma? <laughs> like, could you tell granddad what you wanted? Like, what? how did y'all navigate that space? You had seven kids. Obviously, something was working. Like, you didn't, you didn't leave. <laughs> and um, my grandmother, <laughs> she will sternly correct me when I get out of line, but she's also like, my my grandmother's from the south guys sorry <laughs> i should have prefaced that but um she she'll be like you know now that's none of your business but she'll tell me how she used to talk to my granddad um and it just inspires me to keep pushing and to keep trying to surpass these fears um, another is probably when i first announce what i do when I first <laughs> tell people like, yeah, um, I, I consider myself um, an energy worker that deals with the medium of sex. Um, I consider like I'm certified in erotic touch. Um, I give those sessions to people. <laughs> um, it's not sex, but some people get confused. And so what, like, let's pause for a second, actually, because that's really important. Um, for those people who don't know what erotic touch is or what even like what service or what they want. Like conscious to erotic touches. Tell me a little bit about who you're trying to reach and service and what it is that you actually, you know, what someone, um, uh, broad strokes of what someone could expect from a session or experience. Um, so I'm still getting used to the idea of the fact that I'm technically a sex worker. Like, <laughs> that's what I do. Um, but yeah, you even had to throw in the word technically as a safety. I right, you see, I'm still fighting it. Like, I'm still fighting it. Um, so I offer. I have like a little menu. I offer pleasure mapping, conscious erotic touch, um, masturbation observation, and essentially coaching. So. I'll go through briefly what those are. Pleasure mapping is when I provide you with the tools to express or to, I provide you with the tools to acknowledge and know the arousal zones of your body. Um, each session we pick maybe like five or six different types of touches to focus on. And we literally move throughout the body deciding on a scale of one to 10, what you like and what you don't like. These touches can vary in texture, in the item I'm using, in the, the pressure. Um, and it's an active conversation of consent because each time I move, I'm asking you permission to do so. And so a lot of people have found A, the constant consent conversation to be great and uh, to build that practice and B, for them to know things about themselves that they didn't discover before. Um, and then conscious erotic touch is, um, it's an experience in receiving and your only job is to just receive. And my job is to give you um, intentional love through touch. It involves a bunch of oil. It does involve nudity. Normally I bathe you beforehand. Um, I've had people come off the experience feeling worshiped. I had people come off the experience feeling like not, realizing that they knew how to receive for an hour. <laughs> um, I have people who come off the experience feeling cherished in a different type of love. And then the goal is for arousal, but not for orgasm. And so while I touch all over the body, um, the goal is to heighten your arousal to a point of, of just bliss and love. And so by the time you leave, you know, 
if I do my job right, you're ready to give someone an all-nighter in their life. You know, you're ready, you're, you're charged up. You've received so much love in this moment that you're ready to, to spread that out into the universe. Um, Okay. Well, so before we go, actually, there's a there's a few more minutes left, so I want to I want to actually make sure we get this last part in. If you have a question, go ahead and type it in. But um, if not, we'll keep moving. Where do we people find your stuff? Is there a website? Is it how do how does um, someone go about working with you if that's what they want to do? Uh, you can reach out, find me on Instagram. You can send me a DM. Um, I'm gonna start your posting flyers. Hmm. What's your Instagram? My Instagram is at Amonelise, A-M-O-N-E-L-I-S-E. Um, and you can message me through my, you know, totally safe Google voice number, <laughs> which is 213-986-7445. Um, and we originally, we have like a 30 minute conversation on what to expect, what not to expect. Um, and then maybe three days after that, we schedule an appointment. Um, and the, the sessions usually last about an hour. Um, and then I hope to get a great review from you, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> but it's, it's fantastic. Um, just reach out at any time, ask me questions. I'll give you the whole menu. Um, and we can go from there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for hopping on. Um, if you came on late or you feel like you wanted to hear something again, um, I will email the link out to the community who RSVP'd. So even if they weren't on the live, um, they'll get an email with the link to the recording. And then I'll be editing these down to a podcast for those who don't have the time to sit in front of a YouTube video. Um, for the last sign off, is there anything you want to say? Aman to the people who might be listening or watching or anybody out there. I did notice that you have a crazy mug. Um <laughs> I've switched between some. Hold on. Um this so my friends they like to give me sex mugs. And so this one's queefy and this one is more fats, more femmes. Um, which if you're ever on any dating sites, you know that this is a big deal. Um, because I'm so tired of reading no fats, no femmes on people's bios. Um, and then I have another one that says, uh, but have you ever been topped? And then on the bottom, it goes by a femme. And <laughs> I just, I just love collecting, um, little mugs like this. Um, and I set up multiple for like, for me to drink while we're, we're having this conversation, but I want people I want people to not be afraid to ask questions, to not be afraid to bring playfulness into every aspect of your life, to take a moment to sit and breathe and experience whatever moment you're in, whether that be the way the breeze kisses your neck, whether that be the way the food hits the roof of your mouth, like just stop and experience that fully and allow it to arouse you. Arousal isn't a dangerous state of being, not all the time anyway. <laughs> and um, I want people to be more comfortable in that space, that they can move more comfortably in that space because your energy infects others. And if we all just take small steps to have better sex and better communication between these, ourselves and the world, you'll leave a lasting impression that affects others. And then, you know, maybe I, next generations can be having better sex than we are. <laughs> so that's, that's, that sounds great. I hope that we work towards it. Again, thank you so much for your time. It's great to see you. And I'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye, guys.